You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Traditional psychiatry, integrative medicine, or just someone to talk to, Dr. Carly is here to provide moms with personal solutions so that they may experience whole body, mind, and well being at this most extraordinary time of motherhood. Now, please welcome the host of MD for Moms, Dr. Carly Snyder. Welcome. You are listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. I'm a reproductive and perinatal psychiatrist, meaning I work with women struggling with emotional symptoms throughout their reproductive years. And I'm also the mom of three awesome kids of my own. This show, MD for Moms, is dedicated to helping women enjoy life more, to maximizing health and wellness, and to improving women's relationships with themselves and with others. I'm going to remind you throughout the show that you can call in and ask questions directly on air. The number is 866 451 one four five one. We would love to hear from you, so give us a call. Today, we're talking about a topic that really it touches so many women, and that is disordered eating and eating disorders. Our culture is frankly obsessed with women's bodies, and that obsession, if anything, is intensified during and after pregnancy. Eating disorders are sadly rampant in our country, and mainstream media and our society's warped view of beauty reinforce an unhealthy view of what a normal woman should really look like. Our bodies will inherently change with motherhood, and no one looks the same after having one, let alone two or three or more kids, and that's okay. But for some people, that can be incredibly difficult and can overwhelm their lives. Now, body image issues and eating disorders are not a new topic to this show, nor to my writing. But my guest today, Melanie Rogers, is an expert in the field and will discuss issues that we haven't yet touched upon. That being identification and treatment specifically for us being moms. Melanie works with people who struggle with various eating disorders. She's going to talk more about which ones. She's a founder of the Balance Eating Disorder Treatment Facility in New York City, and she has a really extensive and impressive background in the field. You can read all about her career on my website's blog, carlysnydermd.com. Look under blog. Um, So today, as I said, we're going to talk about eating disorders before, during, and after pregnancy. Welcome, Melanie. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Carly, for the invitation. It's a pleasure. So how did you, in terms of your career, how did you decide to focus on eating disorders? How did I decide to uh, focus on eating disorders? I actually didn't set out to work with eating disorders, but when I was working um, during my training and internship here in New York, I was working at the Obesity Research Center, and so this was about 17 years ago. And working there, they were looking at behaviors around eating, not just food, calories, you know, and exercise. And that really struck me, the psychological component along with the, the food component. Um, and right then and there, they were discussing something called binge eating disorder, which I didn't know anything about back then. And that was my first introduction to this idea of the psychology behind what we choose to eat or in some, in some cases we don't choose to eat. Uh, in other words, the, uh, the illness drives our food and our relationship with food. 
So that was how I got into it and from there then started working with bulimia and also then anorexic clients as well. And tell us, so from there you started Balance, right? Yes, I did, yes. I started Balance about eight, nearly nine years ago and I started Balance Carly because believe it or not here in New York City in Manhattan there was only there was one other treatment center here in the city um, and as an eating disorder um, you know specialist I just was we needed more resources so that was why I started Balance. And can you tell us about the approach Balance takes to eating disorders? Absolutely. So we're in outpatient setting, Carly. That means that our clients come to us during the day, but they go home at night. So what we do here, our philosophy is really making it a, a real world experience. So our clients come in and they're either under eating if they're struggling with anorexia or they're overeating if they're struggling with binge eating disorder. We try to normalize or neutralize their relationship with food. By that I mean instead of counting calories and only eating salad, we want clients to over time and through a lot of exposure therapy to be able to realize that a salad is just as fine as a pizza, as a burger and fries. In the eating disorder world, that neutrality with food is absolutely essential. If you don't get to that point of neutrality with food, Unfortunately, we've seen that it's very, very difficult to recover if you're always uh, fearful of certain foods. So that's probably our biggest thing is, is that food neutrality and ultimately neutrality with body image um, and balance in your life. So those are the long-term goals and our approach is based upon those, those three aspects. I mean, I think that's so wonderful because I have heard of some other programs that really are much more... Um, they're, they have this uh, focus against, for example, sugar. Uh, right. Sugar is a, you know, a gateway drug, et cetera. And, and when I've worked with patients, I, I, I don't believe that, frankly, because you're going to encounter sugar every day and you need to be comfortable eating sugar. Does that mean you need to eat sugar 24 seven? Of course not. No one, that's not healthy. But in reality, if you eat something with sugar in it, you need to be comfortable with that and move along with your life instead of focusing on it and letting it take over your thought process for however long. Um, that seems just as dangerous and unhealthy as, um, anything else. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Carly. And there's been a lot of uh, discussion, if you will, in our in the eating disorder uh, field around this whole idea of sugar addiction. And just to give it some context, though, I think really where it came from is, you know, eating disorders and our treatment of eating disorders is is relatively new from a, a psychiatrically speaking and medically speaking. Um, we've only been treating eating disorders here in the U.S. for probably 25, 30 years at the most. Um, so it's, it's fairly new, relatively speaking, and we haven't really, to be honest with you, had very good treatment for binge eating disorder. We only gave it a diagnostic code um, two years ago. So in the absence of any kind of treatment from the eating disorder field, we've leaned on what we have known, which is what the substance abuse field has done. And so the whole substance abuse field is about obviously abstinence and the idea of, you know, sugar and abstaining from eating sugar was, was kind of a carryover from that. We now know from the research that that's actually, now I know I'm going to, you know, annoy some people by saying this, but we do now know from the research that, you know, there may, may, may be a very, very small percentage of the population who has a true sugar addiction, um, but really that is not what drives binge eating and in fact, uh, restricting sugar and having that kind of an abstinence eating pattern um, actually unfortunately reinforces the binge eating and makes it worse and we have research to support that now. So I totally agree with you Carly that the whole you know sugar abstinence piece um, it's not a long-term solution. Clients may be attracted to it because temporarily, temporarily they may feel better and more in control. But, um, you know, eventually there's going to be a so-called falling off the wagon as clients experience that, which is not their fault, um, and, uh, and they're going to feel out of control. So our goal is to neutralize their relationship with sugar and carbohydrates because uh, actually the brain can't subsist without, without carbohydrates, and we tend to forget that. Yeah, I mean, and, and in truth, right, the food is not bad, 
food is essential, of course, right? You need to survive. Yeah, you need food and you need water. Um, and we need, as mothers, to show our children that food is not bad. Absolutely. Absolutely. As mothers, our role, one of our roles, I think, is to model uh, neutrality with food. So, you know, uh, in any given situation, we might be heading out to Shake Shack for burgers and fries. I mean, kind of fun stuff, right? Or there's pizza because it's a kid's party and that's usually what's served. Mm -hmm. And to be okay with with, with having a, a couple of slices of pizza, and it's no big deal, as opposed to having a meltdown or avoiding it so that you can then, you know, get to your uber healthy salad or, or whatever it may be. So it's important that we, we model um, being okay with that and having a cupcake or two at a, a kid's party or whatever it may be. This is all very normal, um, appropriate behavior around food. And can you explain, you know, this is probably a much longer question answer, but in briefly, what is the difference between disordered eating and an eating disorder? Absolutely. Great question. Um, in short, I would say the, the intensity. So um, eating disorders, to, to have a full-blown eating disorder, it's got to meet certain criteria called, you know, according to the diagnostic code. Now, for many people, they may struggle with food. Their relationship is not exactly neutral. They may be quite obsessed about the food, the calories, the choice of food, their weight, but they're not at a level um, where they've, um, they're dropping heaps of weight very suddenly and their blood work is you know, showing abnormalities and, and this sort of thing. So they're, they're on the spectrum, but they're in a less intense part of the spectrum and hence we call that disordered eating and not a full-blown eating disorder. But I did want to make the point, Carly, though, that I would suggest that a far greater percentage of the population and women in particular struggle with disordered eating than a full-blown eating disorder. So really, for a lot of our clients, I mean, we're certainly dealing with disordered uh, eating disorders, full-blown, but there's a far larger number of people out there who think that their, you know, their issue with food is not significant enough to get treatment. However, it's very, very um, oppressive in their life and it's very disruptive to their life. So it's equally, and I want to validate just how difficult it can be living with disordered eating as it is with an eating disorder. And, you know, so would someone who is uh, adhering to a very strict, very limited diet by virtue, not because of medical reasons, but because they feel that it is going to be the way in which they're going to remain whatever weight they think is the healthiest or the slimmest they can be, would that be considered disordered eating or an eating disorder, assuming that they are not, you know, their lab work is not completely off the charts, right? They are still able to, you know, they, for example, they have children, right? So, you know, they're still functioning and their bodies are relatively healthy, but at the same time, they are incredibly controlled and incredibly fixated on their intake. Yeah, I would say we're definitely getting into the disordered eating realm there. You know, the key words there, fixated, uh, a lot of rigidity, I would imagine. Um, and the question I would ask is, what percentage of the day is, is that type of client thinking about food, weight and calories during the day? Um, and if they were in a situation, they're going to a kid's party and they had to eat a couple of slices of pizza, could they actually do that without their anxiety you know, going through the roof? So those are the indicators to me that it's not just, oh, I like healthy food and I'm... I'm you know, and I have a neutral relationship with food. Otherwise, this is just what I prefer to eat. But it's really if, if you have to eat other foods and you don't have access all the time to that food and you don't have access to do your exercise every day or whatever your routine may be, and that causes you anxiety, we know then that we're in the realm of disordered eating. And is disordered eating um, something that, I mean, I have to imagine people live this way and it's so unnecessary for years and years and years. You know, it's, it's sad. 
We have to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we're talking about disordered eating and eating disorders and motherhood with Melanie Rogers of Balance Treatment Center in New York City. When we come back, we're really going to talk about anxiety and eating and how we can get better. Stay with us. Abuse happens every moment of every day. According to national statistics in the United States, every two minutes, someone is sexually assaulted, and every 10 minutes, a report of child abuse is made. Those currently struggling with abuse, or if you know someone who has been the victim of abuse, you are not alone. Whether physical, mental, emotional, or sexual, no, there is hope, there is help, there is healing. Author Tammy Hall has written a book from her own account of abuse called Journey of Courage that can guide you through your own personal journey of healing. Stop struggling through life. It's your story. It's your healing. And it can begin with the first turn of the page. Visit www.journeyofcourage.com to begin your path to becoming the person you were ultimately created to be. Healed. Hopeful. Happy. Intergenerational programming is uniting America due to the tireless efforts of Dr. Ramona Frischman. Retired from the Miami-Dade County Public School System, Dr. Frischman continues to develop intergenerational learning programs aimed to improve the lives of children, young adults, and seniors through unique strategies and public policy in order to establish a mutually supportive agenda. She views intergenerational programs as a resource for policymakers and the general public on economic, social, and personal initiatives that govern our society. Her work bridges the generational gap, providing many individuals the opportunity to explore areas of common ground and celebrate each other's diversity. Contact Ramona Frischman at RamonaLong at AOL.com or visit www.gu.org to learn more about intergenerational programming. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are talking about eating disorders and disordered eating with Melanie Rogers. Do you have a question? Give us a call. Our phone lines are open, 866-451-1451. And of course, if you want, you can always call anonymously if you have a question. We don't need to use your name. Now, before the break, we were talking about disordered eating versus eating disorders. And, you know, I thought maybe we could talk from, again, now we could talk about motherhood. And in the break, Melanie and I were talking briefly about how pregnancy can really be an interesting time because for some women, it can be a almost cathartic in that there can be a reprieve from the concerns of uh, weight gain because you know you're going to gain weight, right? There is no question. There's almost a, uh, for some women who otherwise are very uh, overwhelmed by the concept of weight gain, right? They, they, it takes the question mark out of it. And they often, I mean, at least from my patient population, you know, there's definitely anxiety about the weight loss component afterwards, but some women do okay. And then there are some women who get bec- become even more uh, obsessive and anxious by virtue of the fact that they have even less control over their bodies throughout pregnancy. And I find that to be so sad because it tends to be that they lose out on part of the joys of pregnancy because rather than thinking about some of the fun parts of pregnancy, some of the beauties, they're really incredibly uh, in their head about their bodies. What What's your experience been in terms of pregnancy and eating disorders? We've, um, we've seen the gamut actually, Carly. I mean, we've certainly seen fortunately a number of our clients who have had uh, disordered eating or even a full-blown eating disorder and they've gone on to uh, become pregnant and we've seen some of them where they've absolutely been able to put the whole concern around body image and food and calories um, over to the side and give themselves permission to just eat normally during the pregnancy and gain the weight that they need to, to gain and they express enormous relief at being able to do that. 
Um, and that for me is always a great thrill, thrill that to your point, they get to actually enjoy the pregnancy for, for what it is and not being obsessed about the weight gain. Unfortunately, we've also seen um, the opposite of that where the clients have really struggled with uh, weight gain during the pregnancy. We've had one, we've had a couple of very difficult cases where um, clients have actually come in here and stayed with us in our program for the whole duration of their uh, pregnancy to make sure that they actually got to full term safely. So those are probably more extreme cases, but they do happen. We've also then had the third category, which is you know women who were you know, pretty well along in their recovery, feeling pretty stable, they've become pregnant, and then unfortunately the eating disorder has really kicked up again or disordered eating um, at the very least. So there's, you know, if you look at the research around this, Cully, those are the, the three main scenarios. Um, and I think for a lot of the women out there, as we were discuss discussing, there's a lot more women out there with disordered eating than a full-blown eating disorder. And so they may actually be very, very caught off guard that as they're going through these, these physical changes, they actually start to have a lot of anxiety as they lose control over their weight and weight gain, which is very normal and natural and has to happen during the pregnancy. Right. And I mean, I've said this on the show many times that I'm, I mean, I'm a very little person, right? I have very small bones. I'm short and I am naturally slight. I'm thin. I also run a lot. And I have said on the show many times, I gain, without a doubt, regardless, frankly, of my dietary choices, I gain 50 pounds with every pregnancy. And that doesn't matter if, you know, with my first, I went to full term. With my second, I went, you know, basically full term. And with my third, I had a preemie. And it, you know, the week before she was born, all of a sudden I blew up like a balloon with a lot of fluid. And I knew she was coming early because I got on the scale and I was like, Whoop, 50 pounds, boom, she's coming. And it was like my little way of knowing. And what I found interesting is when I tell people that in person, People sometimes look at me and they smile. It's like, oh, you know, it's sort of funny. And then there are people who look at me with this look of disgust, like, oh, my God, how could you gain so much weight? And in reality, as I explained, I think a lot of it for me, at least, is genetic. I cannot say that I ate differently. I mean, rather, I didn't eat differently. I did. With my first, I ate a ton. With my second, I ate more a more normal diet for myself. And with my third, I think I ate a very healthy, balanced diet. It really didn't make a difference. And, yeah. you know, it occurs to me that it, uh, people's response to my telling them probably belies a lot of their own concerns about weight gain and weight. Um, yeah. uh, you know, but it's it, I, I find it very sad to think, you know, and I've actually written a lot about this, that women are told to keep to this very tight weight gain restriction, right? 25 to 35 pounds. And sadly for a lot of women, that's, you know, impossible for me. That was completely impossible. If I had tried, I would have failed. Absolutely. It, and if you tried, you would have ended up under eating and that would have actually had a detrimental effect on your pregnancy and the health of your, of your baby, you know? It's it's so true, Carly. I mean, the 25 to 35 pound um, range, while it's a recommendation, there's quite a bit of rigidity. And myself as well, if I may um, also say, I'm, I'm a mum, I have a four-year-old. I was an older mum, I uh, conceived at 43. And um, and I'm, a, I'm a, perhaps our physiques are a little bit similar, Carly. I tend to run on the slighter side. And in the first trimester, I think I, I gained like something like 15 pounds in the first trimester. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm a nutritionist, um, I'm an intuitive eater, and so I ate when I was hungry and I stopped when I was full and I just trusted my body because that's, that's our whole, not just our philosophy here, but that's how the body is actually designed. It's what it's designed to do. And I trusted my body and I wasn't worried about the sudden weight gain in the first trimester because typically a lot of women don't gain that much during that time. And my OB was like, was said to me, okay, let's just be careful now. You know, we don't want to get too big. 
And I, it made me angry because of the work that I do. It made me angry. Now, I knew in my case I trusted my body and I wasn't worried about it getting out of control or whatever. I was just eating when I was hungry and stopping when I was full. So I was fine with that and ultimately I gained 35 to 40 pounds or whatever, again, because my body needed to, Carly, in the way that obviously your body needed to gain 50 pounds. But, you know, for women who are not necessarily... Um, so confident in their body shape and size and can push back and say, well, I'm just following my body, um, you know, I would have actually uh, gone on a diet possibly if I didn't know what I know from my training. I would have panicked and thought I'm gaining too quickly. So you're absolutely right. We have to be careful about the recommendations we're making. And I also think we really have to validate and support women um, that they know their bodies and to trust your body through a very, very natural process. The body's pretty amazing. It's got it figured out very, very well. Um, and if we can tune into that and tune into hunger, fullness and that regulatory system, um, I think you're in really good hands. Yeah, I mean, in truth, if you don't, if you, especially first trimester, if you don't eat, you will feel terrible. Oh, you know, yes. yes. Yeah, I mean, if there's one way to really make sure you're going to be nauseous and have what morning sickness all day, it is by depriving yourself of food. Um, Absolutely. It's just, it's so counterintuitive to try and diet. And yet, if you feel like you are out of control of food and you have a history of kind of regaining control by controlling your eating, so to speak, then one can see how it can be a natural response when you're told, oh, you're gaining too much weight. That's it's right. Just, That's absolutely right. Um, it's just sad, frankly. And I tend to recommend to my patients that they not look at the scale and they tell their OBs that they'd rather not be told unless there is, of course, a medical indication, meaning if they have gestational diabetes and there's a concern there, then that's a different issue. But in that situation, they should see a nutritionist and discuss healthy eating options not go based on numbers. Absolutely. Oh, Carly, that's very, very wise, wise advice is, yeah, to not look at the scale. We, we call it a backward or a blind weigh-in, um, and you might have to remind your OBGYN or your doctor each time you go in that that's what you want um, because, you know, obviously they see a lot of clients and can forget that, but it can really take some of that stress and pressure off, and it can allow you to go into that place of just following your body and knowing that after you have your baby, your body will naturally kind of settle back to uh, a weight that it's going to, you know, um, in a few months. And it does take a few months to, for your body to readjust after going through childbirth. Um, one thing I'd like to say there, Carly, that I have used with some of my clients who have really had a hard time during pregnancy is going through, you know, okay, that 20, so-called 25 to 35 pound weight gain what actually is that comprised of? It's not all true body weight fat as we might think on the body. Six to eight pounds is the baby. And then we've got the, uh, the fluid, of course, that we absolutely need. And that's another five to six pounds. The placenta is, gosh, three to four pounds. The engorgement of our breasts, the breast milk for feeding, another few pounds there. In other words, there's all these very natural um, changes that happen to keep the baby safe while you're going through pregnancy and those fluids and those um, organs and such uh, are, are heavy and add to that weight. So it's not like I gained 35 pounds or in your case, Carly, I gained 50 pounds in the same way that you would if you weren't pregnant. That's a whole other type of weight gain. And I think we get that confused and we freak out, therefore, with those numbers. And I agree with you. And I think it's also really important for people to remember that every pregnancy is different and you're going to look different. And that's OK. I mean, frankly, this is really such an important time in life and it has and postpartum, you'll lose the weight. And if it's not, you know, in three months, it'll be in five, six, nine months. It doesn't matter. Right. It's your body readjusts and it is obviously no one wants to look like a different person per se, you know, once you've had a child, because we are still the same women. However, you can't expect your body to go through the complete transformation that you just went through and then bounce back in five minutes because Absolutely. it's just unrealistic. Not possible. And, 
It is so unrealistic, Carly, and unfortunately if you read People magazine or whatever, we see uh-huh. a lot of celebrity women who, you know, have their pre, pre-pregnancy bodies back in, you know, crazy, six weeks or something. I, I don't even know. Um, but what I tell my clients is, look, it took nine to ten months for the body to go through this amazing, amazing feat. Um, allow yourself the ability to go through the next nine to 12 months um, for your body to readjust and and settle back to normal. In other words, to not put that pressure on yourself um, and to really just to have great gratitude for the fact that your body's even been able to do this and be just gentle with yourself as you're going through a hell of an adjustment being a mum. Even if it's a second or a third time mum, that means that you've also got kids running around while you have a new baby. Mm -hmm. They're all new experiences, you know, and... It's exhausting work. It's uh, hugely taxing on the body and the mind and the emotions. Um, and to not have to worry about your body and just know that by just eating intuitively, trusting in that, taking care of yourself and being gentle with yourself and not judging your body. Give it time and it will absolutely settle back to um, you know pre-pregnancy weight. Now, do you recommend or do you... Uh, for your clients, do you dissuade or recommend weigh-ins for either personal or otherwise? Do you guys do weigh-ins? What's your view on the scale? Yeah, well, we I, I have two views. So if we have a client who's underweight, um, then it's important and we need to restore weight or we need them to have their weight increase. We then need that data. So I will weigh them, but we'll do a blind weigh-in so they don't know their weight. Um, I would say no matter whether we weigh or not with our clients, none of our clients know their weight unless it's something very specific we're we're looking at from an exposure perspective. Um, And for our clients who struggle with overeating or binge eating, my focus, our focus is on their relationship with the food and their behavior with the food and then the scale will take care of itself so I don't feel we need to weigh there again if the client wants me to have some idea of what's going on we'll do a blind weigh in where they won't know the weights but we have them there for future reference if we're looking at kind of overall trends so in other words long story short um, knowing your weight is not critical it's not so important except as I said with our very underweight clients where there's a medical issue um, I, I meant to ask you earlier and I didn't, but maybe you could explain just quickly the different types of eating disorders, because I think people throw around the word anorexia a lot. Um, but in reality, you know, bulimia is also something that people, you know, struggle with and binge eating disorder. I think people have a very skewed view of what that is. It's probably far more common than people think. Absolutely, Carly. Binge eating disorder, which is, uh, to define it quickly, is just uh, eating a lot of food in a short period of time um, is much more prevalent than anorexia and bulimia. And, you know, we are going to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Carly Center. And after the break, Melanie's going to tell us more about the different forms of eating disorders and how they can affect pregnancy and breastfeeding. Don't go away. Hi, my name is Myra Fox, and I am a survivor. I am the founder of the Castle Lewis I Survived Foundation and the author of a series of books entitled I Survived a Murder Untold, which tells the story of my sister and I who were abandoned and left in the care of a woman who beat us repeatedly. Unfortunately, it resulted in the death of my sister, Castle Lewis, which is revealed in a page-to-page chilling story. After spending time in the foster care system, I've documented my suffering and my loss and ultimately my survival. I'm blessed to work daily in my community and surrounding areas to give back by helping others and feeding the homeless. I want to spread awareness of the dangers of abuse. You can purchase my books and contribute to the Castle Lewis I Survive Foundation by visiting www.castlelewis.com or you can call us at 540-999-8401. Thank you. Patricia Fayweather Harlow is passionate about the environment and conserving our natural resources. She's written a five-part book series for all ages called Rock with Rodney and Party with Perky to Preserve Wildlife. 
which brings awareness through these vibrant characters on preserving and protecting our national parks and historic landmarks. Harlow has launched a campaign to mobilize green supporters, informing a united front against big oil, big coal, and the Keystone XL pipeline. And she addresses the controversial practice of fracking in books four and five. She's determined to bring greater awareness to the dangers of drilling and running crude oil through pipelines that cut through pristine landscapes. And she empowers readers to take action in keeping America beautiful. To learn more about Patricia Fayweather Harlow and to purchase her books, visit www.patricia-fayweather-harlow.com. That's F-A-Y-E-R-W-E-A-T-H-E-R. And play your part in preserving the landscape that we all share and love. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and today we are talking about disordered eating and eating disorders in motherhood with Melanie Rogers. And don't forget, you can call with any questions, 866-451-1451. And right before the break, I asked what the difference is between the various eating disorders. And Melanie was saying that binge eating disorder is actually far more common than either anorexia or bulimia, which is interesting because it's really not the one that we hear the most about. Not at all, Carly. Um, not at all. It's, it's, and I think there's because there's a misconception around binge eating disorder, and you touched upon this a little earlier, uh, when we see people um, who are of a higher body weight, we assume, we make many assumptions, it's called a weight bias. We assume that they're lazy and that they overeat and they don't exercise and they're not taking care of themselves. When in fact, um, those uh, people with a higher weight may be struggling with binge eating disorder or possibly emotional eating or compulsive eating, which all kind of cluster together. So in other words, they're struggling with an actual disorder and that disorder, the side effect of that disorder, if you will, is weight gain because of the excessive calories consumed. So that's binge eating disorder. Now, I also want to say that that doesn't mean that any person you see out there who is of a higher weight has binge eating disorder because that, that would be inaccurate. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there where they're struggling silently with their relationship with food and it's not neutral and it feels out of control. And then we have bulimia, um, Carly. Bulimia is where someone may not eat much during the day or very little or, or, or nothing. Um, and then at the end of the day, they're starving. So they, they overeat there. So that would be a lot, looks a lot like binging. However, unlike binge eating disorder, um, that person will then um, get rid of what they've eaten. And that's called purging. And that's done via. Uh, deliberately vomiting or using laxatives or all these types of methods and also compulsive over-exercising is part of that purging uh, profile. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have um, kind of the, the anorexic, which I think as a society we're a little bit more familiar with. Um, if you look at the models, runway models and such, you know, a lot of them are very, very thin. Uh, we assume that, you know, there's a lot of under-eating going on there. Um, so, you know, that's the spectrum of the eating disorders. But I will say, though, that most anorexics don't look so skeletally thin that, um, as you may see in movies and, and documentaries. And most people out there with an eating disorder, you wouldn't know by looking at their size and shape that they're actually struggling. So in this way, it's a very, very um, kind of silent illness and secretive illness. Right. Well, that's a really important, interesting point, right? Because I think that people um, have this misconception and also people who lose a lot of weight when they were perhaps maybe slightly, you know, for example, the woman who's postpartum who all of a sudden drops a ton of weight. The initial response by many is, oh, my God, you look amazing. Yeah, Not, yeah. are you OK? How are things now? In reality, you know, unless you're very close to someone, my bias is you don't really need to ref talk about anyone's weight for any reason. Um, too fat, too thin, to any of the above, it's frankly not anyone's business unless you are family close, right? Unless you have a real personal connection with that person, I think it's really off limits as a topic. Um, but that being said, it's interesting because, you know, there's a, a societal bias towards uh, appreciating weight loss. 
And yet it can really be, you know, someone can actually be really struggling and yet you're, re, you know, you're reaffirming their behavior inadvertently by saying, oh, you look amazing. Well, perhaps that was not the healthy route. Yeah, absolutely. And we hear this from our clients, though, so often, Carly, you know, clients who are at a very um, regular weight, normal weight, however you want to phrase that for their body shape and size and also their genetics, right? We have to remember that our body shape and size and height are dictated mostly by our genetics. So um, clients who've then, uh, you know, lost some weight, you know, whether it be 10 pounds, 15, 20 pounds, and they get all of this positive um, affirmation from people around them, um, you look so great, you look so much better, which then sends the message that, oh, my goodness, I must not have looked very good at the other weight, which may have been your natural body weight in the first place. So it's very addictive and very... Um, I say that word loosely, I mean it, it, it just really kind of leaves our clients with this strong sense of this is a good thing to do, um, I need to continue to do this and it's very seductive um, because you, you certainly want that kind of positive feedback. Uh, what's scary though is, you know, if we have a, you know, a terrible show on TV, um, it's called The Biggest Loser, I don't know if you've ever watched it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we've seen this and now we have the research on this, but those, those uh, you know, clients who went through those horrendous 100-plus pound weight loss um, scenarios, you know, the rest of us in society are going, well done, great job, great job, not realising at all the, the medical complications and the stress on the body that happens um, even for a higher weight person when they lose weight that quickly and that abruptly and under those circumstances. Um, so in other words, you don't know what's going on when people are losing weight and, and I, I would suggest, um, you know, it's not always, it's not always a, so, a so-called good thing, even though as a society we do think it is. Can you speak to the risks associated with uh, rapid weight loss? And does and the caveat to that, does that include, for example, if someone has not necessarily um, because of purely restricting eating, but for example, having had gastric bypass or some other surgical procedure, which you know, I've actually had several patients who have had that and then actually ended up with an eating disorder following that by virtue of they need to be so restrictive in their diet that it becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy and they, it becomes really a negative thing. Now, they needed the surgery initially because they were quite ill in terms of the you know, obesity, but it's a, it's a slippery slope. Um, but the medical implications of such rapid weight loss... Uh, yeah, the medical implications of rapid weight loss, I think we, we tend to forget, well, I think most people don't know, that when you lose weight, um, you lose body fat, so fat uh, tissue, but you also lose muscle mass along with that, and that's unavoidable. Um, and the ratio, just roughly, is, you know, for every one pound you lose of body weight, about 75% of that is... Uh, adipose or fat tissue and the other 25% unavoidably is muscle mass so you are going to lose some muscle. Now when you lose weight extremely quickly you know the whole 30 pounds in 30 days type of scenario that ratio um, is then uh, skews the other way. You predominantly and mostly lose muscle and only a small percentage of that weight loss is actual fat tissue and it's the fat tissue that has been connected more with the health concerns so if we're looking at talking about wanting to lose weight for health reasons you then want to lose the fat tissue is what we believe to be um, you know the, the unhealthy aspect not muscle you want to keep your muscle that's exactly what we want um, so the reverse is happening with massive weight loss now, the other thing to remember, it's not just your muscles, Carly, that you're losing, but your internal organs, your heart, your brain. I mean, all your internal organs are actually made up of some kind of um, muscle component. So all of your systems are affected, and, and people certainly uh, forget that. With our clients 
who uh, end up being very, very underweight. We know that the brain literally shrinks during excessive weight loss and cognitive functioning or, or thinking um, becomes impaired. I mean, it's uh, every single organ in the body is affected through rapid weight loss. And how will that present? Um, what might a woman actually feel well, in that scenario? Well, often feel, yeah, often you'll feel uh, probably tired for sure, uh, very, very fatigued. Um, you may feel dizzy. Uh, let's say you have to walk up some stairs. Your legs might feel like lead, like really heavy. Uh, those sorts of feelings, but overall pretty, um, not terribly specific. It's not like you're going to have an acute pain. It's very subtle in that way. Um, but nonetheless, that is actually what's going on internally. Our concern is first and foremost for the heart and the heart condition. Uh, and we saw this on The Biggest Loser where they actually lost a contestant due to heart failure. So we have all of our clients have EKGs before we will work with them to just get a sense of kind of what's under the hood, pardon the, the analogy, but you know, having a look at the heart gives us a much better indicator of what's really going on physically and medically than just weight and height. That's such a smart way to go. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's so sad when some, something so preventable happens. We have to take another brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and my guest today, Melanie Rogers of Balanced Eating Disorders Treatment Center of New York, is going to tell us after the break how kids may be affected by moms who are suffering from eating disorders. Don't go away. Hello, I'm Steve Fagan, and I'm president and CEO of Fagan Associates, but I'm also a life coach. I'm here to help you reach your dreams, goals, and objectives. As a life coach, it's my job to be your support, to be your teammate, to help you understand what is your dream, what is your life passion, and then together we work as that team to help you reach your specific goals. Life is worth living the best you can be. Working with a life coach, you're fulfilling those dreams and goals is your passion, and it's your way of living. Let me help you do that today. Let me help you really reach the best that you can be as a person and live the life you should be living. I'm Steve Fagan. I'm a life coach, and I'm here for you. Contact Steve Fagan at FaganAssociatesInc.com or call 1-800-239-2701. And I'll be glad to help you move forward to live the life of success. Reach your dreams, your goals, your objectives. We can do it together. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Life is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and our topic today is eating disorders and motherhood with Melanie Rogers of Balanced Eating Disorders Treatment Center in New York City. So before the break, we've been talking about eating disorders and disordered eating and how rapid weight loss can be really dangerous for the body, especially the heart. Now, Going back to more of the sort of disordered eating, so the less severe form, um, when we think about it, you know, I think it's fair to say a lot of women suffer from this, and it's in part based upon our cultural acceptance and cultural um, interest in being thin. Um, you know, look at a runway. Women are not size eight or six, right? They're size zero or two at best. Um but as a result of women 
being very focused on their own bodies. There is, you know, women who have daughters and frankly sons as well, right? How much do you think there is a um, a trickle down phenomenon to kids? How much is a woman's disordered eating going to negatively impact her children? Unfortunately, it's going to impact them quite a lot, Carly, because it's not just um, do as I say. In other words, you know, I'm providing my child with these healthy meals and snacks and and such. The kids are watching what mum's doing. They're noticing that mum has just a salad when for dinner when everyone else has a different kind of meal or everyone has ice cream for dessert but mum doesn't partake or... Uh, You know, mum's weighing herself and commenting constantly, I should lose weight or I need to lose weight. And um, so a lot, a lot of that actually influences the kids uh, far more than we may give them credit for. And I think as mums, we've all kind of seen our child come out with something or they've observed something that you didn't realise they were observing and you're Mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, I need to be aware of that. Or especially, you know, with uh, language choice, for example, as one. Um, So unfortunately, I want to say that uh, what you are doing, your own relationship with food, your kids are going to absolutely pick up on that. And then they're going to get the message that uh, bread is not okay or dessert is not okay. Um, And then they're going to internalize that message and say, if I eat bread or I eat ice cream, I'm bad. I'm doing the wrong thing. And there's going to be guilt that then comes from that. And that kind of internal messaging when it starts so, so young, Carly, is uh, very, very hard to get rid of uh, later on in life. And so we have a lot of clients who come in and see us in their 20s and 30s and 40s even. And, and these, this messaging is like branded in their brain. Um, and it's not based upon anything rational um, or logical, uh, but it's, it's what they, they saw and observed and learned. And... For women like that, um, where they have this very deeply ingrained, shall we call it a ghost almost, right? Will that ever go away? I mean, is it possible with enough work or is that something that is uh, hardwired to that will kind of reemerge in times of stress, for example? Sure. Well, certainly it would reemerge, but what we're able to do, thank goodness, uh, with treatment and awareness once we know what the beliefs are that, you know, we we grew up with. And again, this is not that our parents or our mums or our dads intentionally kind of gave us this messaging. Um, You know, our parents are usually doing the best that they can do and and want the best for their kids. But so we've picked up on this messaging. Now, what we know we can do through, um, there's a therapy called cognitive behavioural therapy that I'm sure you're aware of. And really it's bringing awareness to the thoughts that we have in our hair, in our minds, uh, the beliefs that go behind those thoughts, and then challenging those thoughts and saying, "Well, okay, I'm not sure where that belief came from, but is that really the truth? Is that really true right now? I mean, how bad is bread actually? And am I terrible if I eat bread? Like, where the hell did that come from?" Mm-hmm. Um, and then over time, as we become aware that we have those thoughts and those beliefs. Um, to then catch ourselves having those thoughts, challenge those thoughts. And over time, we can actually move away from uh, being affected by those thoughts in a negative way. So there, there is absolutely hope, and that's probably some of the most uh, important work that I do with my clients is trying to undo um, those deep-seated beliefs and messaging that they got at a young age. And for the women out there who say, but, you know, I don't want to gain weight... I have, I'm aware that I'm, I have disordered eating, but you know, I actually like my body as it is. Will they, by virtue of getting treatment and uh, modifying the thought processes behind eating, will they inherently gain weight? Not inherently. I mean, ultimately, um, This is what we see. There's a lot of women out there and guys, as you said, with disordered eating who are being restrictive. And the reality is that their bodies are not functioning optimally at that restricted weight. Now, that might be uh, five pounds from where their body uh, functions optimally. And I mean this for women perhaps who've even lost their menstrual cycle. So they may say, but this is the body weight I want to be at. And you can certainly choose to be at that body weight. But if you're trying to um, 
maintain a body weight that's below where your body is naturally designed to be from a genetic perspective, um, you're going to have a lot of this um, internal uh, thinking that's going to push you towards food. That's a basic survival mechanism of the brain. So you're going to be very obsessed about food. Um, and so to turn that off, the only way to turn that off actually is through uh, you know, resuming a normal body weight for your shape and size. Um, so the answer to that is if you want to challenge those thoughts, um, not necessarily will you regain weight or increase your weight if you don't choose to. Um, but for some people who want to also give up the disordered eating, often they'll need to gain just a few pounds in order to turn off some of this brain chemistry. And, you know, frankly, I think it's always also important to remember, like, what someone sees, what you see in the mirror is not necessarily and is often not what everyone else sees. So True. what you see is a healthy, a healthy body in the mirror does not mean that is what everyone else sees, right? So I... I challenge a lot of my patients to close their eyes and then open them and look really in that first second, like, what do you see? That bulge of fat that you saw before, is it really there? Or is, is that a figment of your anxiety? Is that, you know, is that something that you are focused on, but is it truly there? And frankly, if it is, who cares? Well, Thank you so much, Melanie Rogers, for joining us. Um, how can our listeners find you real fast? They can go online to balancedtx.com and they can also give us a call on our number 212-645-6903. Well, thank you so much for joining us and thank you to our listeners for joining us. Tune in again next week and every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. This has been an episode of MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Until next time, be well, enjoy life, and thanks for listening. You've been listening to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Please join us each and every week for answers to the many challenging issues moms face today on the next episode of Dr. Carly's MD for Moms. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.